Okay, let me get this set up. <clears throat> this has been such an interesting journey on the uh, technical side of things. Yeah, I know. I'm learning um, video recording, filming, editing, etc. to um, start doing what I do online. As yeah, well. I was going to say, are you going to do virtual wine tastings with, uh, with people? Uh, we'll start doing that. I'm uh, now launching the online programming, so it will be a prepackaged or set of prepackaged courses that people can sign up for, download, uh, take cool. exams, get certificates for. Yeah, awesome. it's going to be a lot of fun. Well, let's talk about that too. So, all right. One, Right. Here we go. Here we go. All right. Hello, everybody. Buongiorno and welcome again to another uh, day on Adventures with Sarah. And today we're going to have what I hope is a recurring feature, which is Wines Day. Today is Wednesday, but we're going to call it Wines Day. And joining me today live from Sicily is my friend Ben Spencer. Buon buonasera, Ben. <laughs> buonasera, buongiorno. How are and you I doing? I'm doing good, actually. It's uh, a little bit of afternoon drinking here, so that's fine with me. <laughs> nice. I like it. I approve. <laughs> so um, just so those of you out there who don't know um, my friend Ben, I met Ben a few years ago when uh, Alfio Di Mauro and I were working on the Sicily book for Rick Steves, and Ben took the two of us around, along with our friend Brittany, took us around uh, the north base of Etna and introduced us to a lot of winemakers because he's sort of a wine expert there. So you run the Etna Wine School, and can you tell us a little bit about what you do there? Sure. Um, Etna Wine School was um, designed to bring anybody who's interested in Etna's volcanic wines, the wine region, and also the, the culinary traditions of Etna, um, really into the community to give people a chance to connect with the winemakers, the wine traditions, and also the uh, culinary pairings of um, Sicilian cuisine in this part of the island, um, and bring it into a real tangible way. And uh, So I'm doing that, but also I started out uh, consulting as a winemaker for the first three years that I lived here, and um, I do just a little bit about everything, a little translation, some web design, stuff like that too. And you've just written and published your first book, is that right? I have, I have, yeah, uh, I have a copy right here. Um, the New Wines of Mount Etna. It's um, the first book in English about the wines, the history, and also um, the wineries who are working on the volcano today. It's uh, part guide, but also a deep dive into the history of Etna and why it's the coolest wine region in the world. All right. Well, I already know why that is, but I would bet you the people watching don't know why uh, why that is. Because Sicilian wine actually uh, is pretty common. I mean, you can even find it in the U.S. But most of the Sicilian wine that people know about is not from Etna. It's like Nero Davola and Marsala. It's from the West Coast. Um, and, but this is East Coast wine, and it comes from the, the volcano. So tell us a little bit about why that's such an exciting wine zone these days. Sure. Well, it is uh, an incredible boutique wine region. And by that, I mean Etna's total production is less than 1% of what Sicily makes now. So the entire western two-thirds of the island and even the southern half of the island um, is and has been dedicated to doing a lot of research and investment in 
producing wines of uh, premium and premium and ultra premium quality uh, based on traditional grape varieties grown here in Sicily, but also international varieties that are grown um, around the world these days. And this all kind of started in the, uh, in the 70s, um, post-World War II, certainly, but the, the real investment started in the 70s. But on Etna, things didn't really take that shape. Um, for millennia now, uh, the volcano that is literally positioned on the eastern, uh, the eastern coastline and stands 10,000 feet above the sea, um, has been producing wine of a bulk quality. Um, and by that, I mean not what we consider fine wine today. So uh, beginning in the 70s and 80s, as I mentioned, with, uh, with Western Sicily and Southern, uh, Southeastern Sicily, a lot of the producers look to shift this tradition of, of bulk wine or just common wine, table wine, simple, simple wines, into a premium quality category. And Etna, starting in at the end of the 1980s and into the mid to latter part of the 1990s, you see this complete switch from bulk wine to fine wine. So we really see this jump or this leap in quality over premium wines. And, and you do see at the wines at, at uh, um, you know, 10 to $20 um, price point. But uh, the producers here are working very hard, uh, doing everything by the hand uh, in these little boutique vineyards at 400 to 1,000 meters above sea level, making really scarce quantities. Um, and they're doing this uh, with, with the utmost care. And this has only happened in the last 25 to 30 years. So you've seen this complete like, light switch moment that occurred. And um, you, know, you see a, a range of wines, but the wines here really are uh, shooting for uh, an ultra premium quality that is both collectible and also speaks about the terrain and the local varieties like Caracante and Norello Mascalese. And these are things that some people never have had a chance to try. And it's, it's a fantastic opportunity to try something new, and, you know, check out, uh, check out the old relics of ancient Sicily that are still alive here today. So what brought you to Sicily initially? Because, you know, Sicily is a very particular place. I know what brought me to Sicily and, and you know, nobody has a, a straight line story of how they end up on the island. So what's your story? Yeah, um, it started a long time ago. Um, I actually fell in love with Italy at a very young age, but didn't actually make my way over here um, to Italy. And I mean, Northern Italy at the time until 1998. I lived in Florence for a few months. And then again in 2002, uh, I lived in Milan and Tuscany. But I never made it south of uh, Rome, for example, until 2007, uh, one year after I had met uh, my wife to be, Nadine. Um, and she's from here. So she wanted to bring me here for one year anniversary. And, you know, I, I grew up, I, I'm, I'm a writer by nature. It's, it's what I do. And um, the first day we arrived, it's, it's hotter than Hades. Um, I, I'm like searching for any you know, little corner of shade um, just to stay cool. And, you know, we arrive at this house and it is on the sea. It's between the water and the volcano. And we go for a walk uh, that afternoon or evening. And um, we just had the most simple wine, but the most delicious thing that I'd ever had in my life. And um, I knew that moment, that first day in 2007, on our anniversary trip, that we would absolutely end up living in, in Sicily. And for me, it was, you know, a little bit of Hemingway, you know, living uh, between the, the water and fire and uh, but it was also a way of life 
I'd been making wine in California for 10 years um, by the time we moved over here in 2012. So by then, five years. And um, you know, everything was sort of organized as far as wine goes for me. Um, it was something that was packaged. It was sold at high prices to get really good scores. And the goal was um, something different than just drinking a, a quaffing wine at the table with friends and almost forgetting about the wine because it was such a part of the, of the day. And um, coming, to, coming to Sicily for me was an, an eye-opening situation for the lack of interest in wine. <laughs> Uh, in the sense that it's as common for uh, for everyone here as like milk may be for uh, the American um, community, um, but for me it had this you know, airiness about it, this ethereal uh, quality about it, um, both you know in my studies, but also in this like plastic cup that had no uh, no variety, no no price point. It was sold by the leader. Um, you know, two two euros for a liter of wine that was spectacular. Um, so there was a there was a lot of interesting things that draw me drew me here, and um, it was certainly a change of of life, change of quality in life, and a slowing down um, and a more purposeful day to day that uh, really you know got us over here eventually uh, five years later. Yeah, so it, I would absolutely say that that Sicily tends to uh, reset your priorities. I would definitely say that, you know, it's being attached to that island has completely changed my life for sure. Um, and yeah, it refocuses your priorities, refocuses the things that you think are important. And on the wine front, um, I just think about when I lived in, in Rome in college, I lived in Rome in 1995 and uh, wine had always been something that fancy people had. And when I started living in Rome, it was something that was just on the table. You just went and you got it. And like you said, I'd go to like the shop that had the big barrels and I'd bring my plastic jug and they'd fill it up for, you know, a dollar. And, and you just had that. And I remember my mom coming and staying with me and she'd never, ever had any wine. I mean, my mom is probably watching this. She's going to get embarrassed, but she'd never, I'd never <laughs> seen her drink wine except for like my grandparents' anniversary party. And she started drinking wine with me and my friends because that's, it's like milk, like you say, it's on the table with dinner. And uh, when she went home, she started buying wine and my sister called me in Rome one day and said, you broke mom. <laughs> 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 she drinks wine now, what happened? And you know, that is, it's just a, a lifestyle difference. And I think that that encapsulates so much the, the difference in attitudes towards wine in the United States versus attitude toward wine in not just in Italy, but very specifically in Sicily, that I guess wine's a human right, you know? Yeah, yeah. It's like air and, and mama's cooking. Mm -hmm. It's just and a nap. Up. Yeah, and the <laughs> thing I find interesting is that, you know, so many people that I've met in Sicily, they, they have their own family wine and that's just the thing. And it's not a big deal. Their family has a farm and they make wine for the whole family and it's not a fancy snooty thing. It's just, you know. It's, it's a it's thing. What you do. It's what you do. Yeah. 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 So um, you, you've settled in Riposto, which is a really beautiful little seaside village. So why did you choose that as your location? Because it has great access to the north face of Etna, or was there a better reason? Yeah. Um, well, actually, um, Nadine's family is uh, based here. So she more or less uh, grew up here as a young girl. And so this was always home. Um, when we arrived in 2012, we left California, where I was where I was working. She was also working um, in, in publishing. I was making wine, um, but we came here for the absolute, you know, uh, contrast to our busy lives and um, you know just the the seasonality of life. We wanted that that change. And Riposto is uh, a very old. Um, merchant town. It was the place where all the wines were brought down uh, from the mountain to the seaside uh, to be blended and then shipped off to other places like <clears throat> the Italian peninsula or Malta, even France. Um, and it 
it for me was like a, a no brainer. You know, it's gorgeous. It's got this historical uh, beauty, this uh, deep tradition with wine. Um, it's uh, right on the train line. Uh, it's five minutes or so from the highway. And I can get just about anywhere on the volcano in 45 minutes, you know, depending on traffic and sheep and things like that. Um, but yeah, it's, it's the perfect spot. And, um, you know, I keep telling people to come here and, and check it out. And uh, I encourage people to definitely check out Reposto if they, if they can get here. And it's a little bit more chill than Catania. Uh, it's not as shishi as Taramina. Yeah. And it's a little bit less right. chaotic. Because Catania is pretty, pretty chaotic. <laughs> Beautiful. Yeah. City. yeah. But yeah, that takes. Uh, yeah. Yeah, where you live is like a pretty little beach town. And yeah, I can see I, when I when I went and visited you there, I thought I could see myself buying a little little cottage here close to the beach. And that wouldn't that would not yeah. be terrible. So who knows, maybe someday. Yeah. So um, yeah. so uh, when when we went to Etna, we focused on the north face of Etna. And one of the things that I found really intriguing about that visit was that it was clear that, yeah, 30 or 40 years ago, those were just those same little family farms that made wine for their family. And one of the, the features that I found really fascinating, uh, and I, I need to write about this myself because it's, I just have never seen anything like it, is the palmento. And uh, this way that they had the structure within their, um, their buildings where they would press wine with these big sort of logs, like timbers and stones and things like that. It looked like I Love Lucy, like the stomping the grapes with the feet sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, and I know that the European Union, of course, does not smile upon stomping uh, grapes with the feet. But can you tell us a little bit about how the old style, the old process of making wine went there? Because I had never seen anything like that in Italy, actually. Yeah, sure. Um, so um, like with anything in Sicily, that uh, the tradition of winemaking that way has, uh, has ancient origins. So on Etna, um, uh, in the uh, northern Alcantara Valley and the foothills of the Nebrity mountain range, which um, is just to the north of the Mount Etna, um, north slope of Mount Etna, um, you see these very large sandstone boulders that were carved out into uh, two locations. If you can imagine a very shallow pista or treading area on the top. And then in the shoulder of that boulder, a deeper vat carved really into the stone where the juice could flow into after macerating it with your feet, really simple. Um, and then, you know, you could pitch the, the skins in if you, if you wanted to, it wasn't necessary, but you know, these were open air um, uh, under the sky winemaking sites. So absolutely holy places. Um, and you can find, you know, caves in this area as well. But that palmento system uh, it emerged out of this gravity operated or natural process of, uh, you know, carrying the grapes up and then moving them through, uh, through that natural uh, gravitational pull. And these palmenti uh, that uh, are on Etna today are now in houses and they're not uh, carved in boulders anymore, but volcanic stone is used and it's still a three uh, or even four tier system where the grapes are treaded there's a fermentation vat and once fermentation begins the uh, grapes and the skins separate they can just wait for that a couple days and they just open up a valve the juice comes out the skins are left behind they could scoop those up and put them under the the konzu or the kianka the, the wood press, which is a lever system built by Pliny the Elder <laughs> and was in use here on Etna until, I mean, some people still use it for their home line. You can't use Palmenti anymore for uh, quality wines that are sold um, in Italy or to, or to consumers or retailers, what have you. And so this, this really old system, very simple way of making wine uh, was used until 1978 once the EU started to crack down on, on quality 
And um, basically it's just because the vats are open, they're susceptible to uh, you know, fruit flies and you know, overheating and over oxidation, making it not a very pleasant wine to drink. You know, it's something you could put, um, oh, bravo. Yeah, uh, it's something the image you here could, so, you, so we can show people what we're talking about. Cause I was thinking. Perfect, yeah. There you go. So there's, there's kind of an old palmetto. They're kind of strange looking creatures there you go so yeah so yeah. That's the, the upper level and then it feeds down to the intermediate level there is that correct correct yeah and so and so where you see that little screw in the middle is where a, a, a wogan basket would have been wrapped around the grape skins that were already sort of pre-fermented and uh, that piece of wood just in the in, in the background behind the screw uh, would be placed on top of that woven uh, basket, and then that screw would just be cranked down. And this is this is uh, Palmento Santo Spirito now Palmento Costanzo uh, that you just pulled up there. Uh, that actually happens to be the first Palmento that I visited when I moved here in 2012. So oh, that's kind of a we nice, didn't even nice, coordinate nice that. Throwback. <laughs> Not at all. Um, so the, the palmento, the palmento system is 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 really intriguing and fascinating. The wine that I tasted from that very palmento that you just showed um, was st is still on my list of maybe the top five wines I've ever had in my life. Wow! But it's illegal because it's made in that open facility, and it. It's another one of those fascinating things about Etna and the history here. You know, it's wine being made that way for millennia never never killed anybody. There's nothing in wine um, with an alcohol of the common level of, of wine that we see today that could possibly uh, hurt you. And uh, yet it, it, it's illegal for people to make it that way. And, um, but there are 2,000 of those on Etna. And uh, in the tours that I do give here on the mountain, we do visit those. And there are even these palmenti rupestri, these stone boulders that we can add into that if somebody was interested in, in seeing the progression of, of winemaking from the ancient way to the most modern, um, you know, wood eggs and uh, micro oxidation and things of that sort. So it's, it, Etna is a place that has literally everything, including the, the volcanic terrain, the changes in weather, and um, the innovative winemaking that people are doing here as well. So it, it's a fascinating place. And uh, the more I study it, the more I, I fall in love with it. Well, and I found uh, it was fascinating the day that, the, the times that I've spent with you, I spent a couple of days on Etna with you working on um, yeah. the guidebook stuff. and. I remember one of the places you took me to uh, was their, their field, their vineyard, had a big lava flow that was in the middle of the field, which was fascinating. And also, I just couldn't believe the, the diversity of, of levels of wineries. You know, there are the really old school farmer run, you know, they have, every place has a palmento, they don't all use them, but you know, some of them are really old fashioned. Some of them are super cutting edge and modern, where there's obviously been a lot of money put into their facilities. So yeah, that diversity, I don't know that I've ever seen in such a small zone, so many directions people are taking winemaking. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's really intriguing. <clears throat> One of the fun things about Aetna is that, um, as I write uh, in, my, in my book, I think a lot of people are still very much learning on the job. Um, that doesn't mean that the quality is, um, is less for that. Uh, what I mean is that the terrain hasn't really been farmed and the varieties haven't really been fully discovered for fine winemaking um, ever. Uh, all the modern tools and tricks that we have for making any type of wine from sparkling classic method, champagne method, uh, sparkling wines to uh, raisin wines are, is being done here. And everyone has an interesting plot and everyone has an interesting recipe in their vineyard, meaning like 
the common varieties that are used in Aetna DOC wines, but also these little spices of uh, relic varieties that are still sown into the vineyard or throughout the vineyard. And, and also the intention of, of, of the winemaker and what they want to do with their wine, whether it's uh, something more minimal or natural or something uh, uber intensive and 100% uh, you know, authoritative as to the destination of that wine. And um, it, it's all here. And um, if people want to come, they can uh, experience that. I encourage people to come for six months if they can. <laughs> <You're on. laughs> First plane I can get on, believe me, Sicily is where I'm heading as soon as the planes start flying. Um, so uh, one of the questions that we, we have from the viewers are that um, somebody would like to hear about what are these heirloom variety um, grapes? Because this is something I have found really interesting. The grape varieties that are used in Etna wines are ones I've never even heard of. And the other thing that I've learned through you and through other friends on Etna is that um, because of the fact that the, the phylloxera virus didn't really affect Sicily as, meant, as much as other places, they have some really old vines that you can't find other places. And that they're, a lot of the wineries are using those really old vines to, to experiment and do different things. So what are these, these right. native varieties that you find only on Etna? So uh, predominantly for the Etna DOC uh, wines, we are looking at Caracante. It's uh, a white grape that's used for Etna Bianco and also a bit of Caterato, which is the dominant white grape that's grown throughout Sicily. And uh, these are the two you know, dominant blenders in Etna Bianco and also Etna Bianco Superiore, which is a, a wine that comes from uh, the, the commune or the municipality of uh, Milo on the East Slope. Um, the reds and rosés are also made with um, Norello Mascalese. Norello um, is a pale black grape variety that has really good tannins, really nice fruit, um, but is, is otherwise not very dark or opaque. So blending into that, you have Norello Capuccio. And this is the um, dominant blender for Etna Rosso's and Etna Rosso Reserva. Um, now, uh, Norello Muscalese is super versatile. And this is a grape that can also be used to make uh, sparkling wines in the champagne method, and also sparkling uh, you know, white and rosé, uh, rosato um, wines in this method. But it also can be used to make uh, raisin wines. And there are even producers experimenting with white wines from the black grape, still table wines. Um, so these are the common ones we see. Uh, and then thrown into that mix, you see things like uh, Terribile or Minella, Minella Bianca, Minella Nera. You see um, um, Cote di Volpe or Griconico, Griconico Dorato, and even uh, wines from or grapes from the west of Sicily like Grillo and Enzolia. Now, these are all mixed into most vineyards. Some of the newer, younger vineyards are typically planted with one variety or a few clones of the same variety. And so it's sort of an intentional planting. But all these little relics that are uh, found in vineyards um, throughout Etna, especially the older ones and the uh, pre phylloxera vineyards, are throwbacks to the medieval period when it was common because of the palmento system and because how fast that uh, that fermentation took place uh, you know two days you know, yeah, when compared to what we do in like 10 to 14 days here um, by using temperature control and these types of things to slow down the fermentation process um, you, you start to see these, these relic varieties uh, sort of hanging on through time as Caracante, Caterato, Norello, and Norello Muscalese, and Norello Capuccio become the favored variety. So spiced throughout the vineyard uh, to 
enhance this very quick fermentation and support the flavors uh, that are um, sort of being cooked up violently in this two-day fermentation. Um, you can imagine by adding one variety with tannin or another variety with uh, aromas like Gewürztraminer, for example, not that that's a very popular variety here, but an aromatic uh, variety, and maybe another one for the bulk quantity, and another one for an herbal quality that your clients prefer. Something to this effect, you have a more complex wine um, that remains after that violent, quick two-day fermentation. And um, still today, these, these little um, accents that were at one point very important for wine production are, are still remaining in, in the vineyard. It might be a plant or it might be 20 plants or as in the case of Minella, you may find it one plant every 10 plants or so. Um, but typically it's the oldest vineyards that have these relics and they're they're interspiced into or interspiced into the um, into the vines and you just stumble across them and um, uh, sometimes it adds something sometimes it really doesn't um, you have to really um, sort of search for it uh, if you're if you're looking for the the difference with the composite or the, the, the total composition is really what everyone's after yeah. Well, to give people a little flavor real quick of what we're, of the area we're talking about, I just want to pull up again a quick oh, just, uh, image that I want to share. Um, I'm kind of doing this off the cuff. I should have actually pulled up my own photos, but this area, this right here, I think is very interesting. This is a little train, uh, the uh, Chircometnea, that is, that goes around mm -hmm. the, the mountain and stops in some of these areas where there are vineyards. But this is just to give you a flavor of what the ter terrain looks like, uh, because you're, you're actually on, you know, the mountain. And uh, you have at the base of the mountain, all of these vineyards, like this is a great shot here. There's the mountain and you've got just vineyards and lava flows. <laughs> so this is yeah, the- That's great the vineyard thing. that we were in. That's the vineyard that we went to. That's yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Chiara. Yeah. yeah, that was such, a, such an incredibly weird and interesting thing because she said that they had actually had vineyards there for generations, but then a lava flow happened. I think it was in the eighties, she said, and, and it ate up part of their territory. So, um, it's really a landscape beyond imagination. It's such a strange thing. This was another, I think we might've been to this one actually as well, where it was terraces like this of uh, grapes. So yeah, so just to give you guys a flavor of what we're talking about, I think beyond just the, um, the interesting kinds of wines that you can have there, I don't think I've ever seen a more spectacular, visually, visually stunning um, area of wine growing anywhere. I mean, I don't know. What do you think? <laughs> I, I absolutely agree. Um, I, every time I go up, um, I, I try to take my time getting around uh, because <clears throat> I like to get lost a little bit. I like to uh, sort of find my way around the mountain. And um, you find these just gorgeous corners, these impeccable vistas, these just stunning outcroppings of, of lava that almost consumed a home. You see um, just miles of wild blackberries, um, chestnuts when they're in season in late summer. You see um, you know, cherries just growing wild everywhere. And then you are literally on the largest active volcano in Europe. You can see Reggio Calabria and Malta in some places. Um, even on a super clear day from Erice, which is on the west coast, you can see Etna. And it is, um, it, it's almost everywhere you go, it's stunning. Yeah, I remember and, that actually um, one day, Alfio and I were in uh, Mondello, which is near Palermo, and we could see Etna from that far away. It was really crazy to, that I didn't realize the mountain dominated the island, even from the far west coast. So um, one of the days that I spent with you that I thought was one of the more magical days I've had on the island was when we did that um, combination of exploring the mountain in a four by four, and then we went and did a wine tasting. And that, I think, in terms of days, 
at, for a traveler, that was one of the wildest kind of days because we went out in this Jeep. I think there were what, there was like five of us and we went over all right. of the different craters and we had a naturalist sort of explain uh, all of the, the geology behind it. And then we went clonking down the mountain through all these craters off-roading. And then we went to this elegant wine tasting with this beautiful view of the mountain. Uh, and that's the kind of stuff you offer up with your day tours, is that right? Correct. Yeah, there's um, over the years I've been developing as many options as as we can possibly do. <laughs> um, in and one of the days is that volcano plus wine excursion. Uh, but there's there's plenty of little a la carte accents that I've added over over the years and um, you know pairing food and wine or little enoteca visits and um, gelato and granita courses and all sorts of things. Yeah you know this is the funny thing is that people keep saying oh you know you have the world before you you do tours all, all over the world why do you keep going back to Sicily why do you keep getting trapped in Sicily and for me it's like because I keep discovering that there's more and more to do there are more and more interesting things and it's such an undiscovered place I mean I really feel yeah. like tourism still hasn't really arrived in in Sicily so uh, let's uh, keep it our no, little it, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll keep this we'll keep this just to ourselves so uh, it'll it'll stay pristine and um, and uh, as natural as, as possible it's been it's been a real interesting th thing to see how it has changed in the last um, oh, last eight years or so since I've been here and it is Sicily and Etna in particular, it's not necessarily that it's super busy because it's really not. There are locations where it, it can be busy, but uh, for the most part, it's quiet, it's peaceful, and um, the wineries, the restaurants are all really trying to put their best foot forward. Um, so this is like the, the best moment to be here because everyone's put that effort in, but there's still not a lot of traffic. And um, yeah, it's, it's like the, seriously, the best moment to be here. Well, we were really hoping with our book that we would be able to change that formula. But unfortunately, this COVID thing has put a little roadblock in the way of us promoting Sicily as a destination. But we still have it for ourselves. So that works out pretty well. Yeah. Uh, there's a really good question exactly. from a viewer right now. And they're wondering, is there a danger from the lava where, uh, where you live? And how do people feel about the risks of the lava uh, destroying their homes or their vineyards? Yeah, um, well, I think people would be fairly upset about having their vineyards destroyed. I, I think that goes without saying. Uh, there is always that risk, um, but Etna is uh, perpetually active. Uh, and so all of that magma that's um, stirring up uh, inside the mountain um, is releasing steam constantly. And so the pressure buildup and the eruptions typically are coming out of the central craters, which um, is 10,000 feet. So about 9,000 feet above where the uh, producer's highest vineyards are located. Um, so what we, what growers and producers may be um, concerned about maybe is a heavy pyroclastic eruption where it's not just very fine sand or ash that gets emitted out um, out of the volcano but a um, uh, little bit larger uh, lapili which is um, basically very uh, very small pumice stones but because they're composed of silica they can be uh, or gla melted glass they can be uh, very sharp if they come down into the vineyard, they can cut leaves or pierce uh, uh, clusters, the berries, especially around harvest. So those, those are the main concerns. The, the effusive eruptions, uh, the, the liquid lava that comes out, um, it is mostly contained to the upper, uh, upper third of the volcano. Yeah, and it's very um, viscous too, so it moves so slowly that the only way you'd actually get killed by a lava eruption on Etna is if somebody like stapled you to the ground. 
I mean, more or less. You could, you could uh, easily outpace it. So, well, I think it would be fun to go ahead and start drinking a little bit of wine with you. So um, Ben and I talked ahead of time and I went and I looked through my stash of wine to see what I had from Sicily. And I got this bottle of um, wine from the Gambino Winery. It's called Tifeo. It's a 2016 Etna and it's a uh, a DOP, which we'll talk about what that means. Uh, I got this because I was looking for more uh, wineries to put into the Sicily book, and I also have been writing a little bit about wine for some websites. And uh, I went to talk to them, and he's got the same one. And Gambino yep. is one of the big dogs on the mountain. Uh, and one of the things I was looking for um, on Etna was I was looking for a place where people didn't need to reserve a tasting way ahead, because almost all of the wineries there are these tiny little family wineries and you can't go knock on the door uh, because there's probably no one at home. Uh, and we as Americans are used to as, you know, wine connoisseurs, if we go to the Napa Valley, you get up in the morning, you see where the day takes you, there's tastings from five, you know, 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. and you come as you like. But that's not how it works, especially not on the north face of Etna. So Gambino was one of the only places I found where they took drop-ins. If you just wanted to show up, you could. So this is why I, I like them and I wanted to go check them out just in case people are in Sicily, they're driving around, oh, let's go do a wine tasting. You're totally out of luck, except for Gambino. <laughs> but they really well, are kind of like the, the wine tasting factory. It was full of, full of people. It was really, really hopping, but their location is really magnificent. So what can you tell us yeah. about this wine? Well, uh, first of all, cheers. Do you have your glass? I have my glass right here. Very I nice. Correct shape. Ooh, that's a nice color. Yeah, it's it's a beautiful, beautiful wine. Ooh, yeah. Gosh, even from the first. <laughs> this brings me right back to to Sicily. <laughs> that, that was actually my response when I put my nose in here today too. I was like, oh. <laughs> so, yeah. Cheers. Cheers. Clink. Clink. <laughs> Wow, that's really good. <laughs> yeah, it's, I think this is the perfect moment to be tasting this wine. Wow. So um, Tifeo is an Etna Rosso, and as you mentioned, a DOP. It's, DOP is very much like a, a DOC. However, in, in recent years, uh, instead of denominazione di origine controllata, they've replaced controllata or the word controlled with protetta or protected. So rather than it being a controlled area of, of wine production, it's a protected area of wine production. It's a little bit more savvy um, uh, marketing, but it's also a way to connect wine and food um, in, in a way that maybe communicates or, or communicates with consumers and, and uh, buyers a little bit better. So it's not something that's you know, analyzed and, and boxed in, but something that's you know, cuddled. <laughs> And um, so this is, uh, as I mentioned, this is an Etna Rosso. And so this is a Norello Muscalese, minimum 80%, with 20% uh, or less of the Norello Capucho as a blender. It's uh, a wine that's grown uh, up above Lingua Glossa on the northeast slope of the volcano, a very windy location, but also really kind of nicely tucked inside what remains of uh, some of the last forests on Etna. So it's, it's a wine that you taste a little bit of that forest bramble fruit, blackberries, wild cherries, maybe an accent of ripe uh, strawberry even, but um, it's also uh, very elegant and light on the palate. Um, it's got really good acidity because it's grown so high up the mountain and the, the vineyards are so windblown, um, but it's also uh, very well maintained. It spends um, a bit of time in uh, Barrique, but also uh, Tonneau, which is uh, 500 liter uh, wood. And if I'm not mistaken, uh, most or all of the barrels are used. And so they don't have that real hard or heavy impression of like vanilla and cedar that you would get from a new 
uh, oak barrel, but you do have that really nice softness that comes with that barrel aging, that uh, concentration in wood where some of that water moves out of the barrel and into the less humid cellar and the oxygen moves into the barrel to kind of help bind up the color and the tannins and, and everything that's in the wine. And for the people out there who don't know the difference between all of these things, so wines can typically be made um, in a big stainless steel tank, which is cheap. Correct. People love making that, but those are lower cost wines because that, the, you know, you can reuse a stainless steel tank a million times. Um, but then there's also barrique, as he's talking about, which is what we think of as a wine barrel, which is a higher end thing. And you only want to put your better grapes in there because those cost a fortune. But what the wine gets is it leaches tastes out of the wood, out of the oak, uh, typically it's made of oak. And then the other ones, which are something that I, I don't see quite as much on mainland in Italy, but in Sicily, I've seen the ones you, what are they called? Ton, tondo? Tonno? big ones? Oh, no. Oh, no. Yeah, so there are these giant, giant barrels, and the difference between that and the barrique is the barrique, you're going to get lots of wood taste because there's, it's a, you know, smaller um, space. When you have the big one, you just get a little hint of the taste of, of wood, uh, and those are often used very, very frequently, whereas the barriques kind of, you know, they age out because there's no flavor being imparted anymore, and that's why we buy them and put them in our gardens. <laughs> hey, nice. And make benches and bars out of them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So typically a wine that is uh, aged in oak like this is going to cost, what, probably 20, 30% more, maybe more. Yeah, uh, especially if the barrels are new. If they're second or third use barrels, they're not going to be uh, as expensive to buy. And so that bottle price is going to come down. And so I believe this this wine will sell for about 20 to 25 euros here. I could be wrong, but I believe that's the price point on this. And um, in, in the US or abroad might be slightly higher than that for the, um, the duty cost of importing it. But um, the 2016 vintage for me is, is a classic vintage for Aetna. It's, um, I was thinking about this today <clears throat> when, uh, when the wine was on its way down from the water. <laughs> and, um, the 2016 vintage is a year that people don't really talk about in a way. You have like 2015 people talk about because there were, you know, problems and very low yields and 17 because it was so hot and there was drought and 14 because it was perfect. But 16, there's not a lot of talk about it. It's, it's like the perfect year that kind of uh, sits back in the corner and you know, minds its business and is a stellar, stellar vintage for for whites and reds, in, in my opinion. So we picked a good one to taste. Yeah, it's really good. So um, you're you're a professional sommelier. I am just an amateur wine guzzler. So tell me a little bit about uh, what you taste when you taste this, because I noticed immediately that it was definitely from a barrique, and I can tell that just because. For me, I, the trigger is it smells buttery. So for me, this had a buttery, and I love barrique aged wines. So what are the other mm -hmm. things that you're, you're thinking about this wine? So for me also, like uh, with, uh, when we're looking at uh, the aromas in wine, uh, uh, what we see in wines that are aged in, or uh, stored in and fermented in stainless steel or other inert containers like uh, fiberglass, for example, you sense, a bit more primary fruit than this, which is a little is a little bit more developed, a little bit softer fruit, a little bit more in in the back seat as far as the the um, sort of you know, forthrightness of the fruit is. And so for me, it's it's got just a couple of years of age, which is great. It's perfect timing for this. But um, Norello is a, a very uh, nice ruby color. It doesn't have a, a lot of purple notes to it. So if you put this up to a light, you can actually see through it. And it's a very attractive color to me. I call it royal ruby. Um, and on the nose, you're definitely picking up a, a little bit of wood. It's very subtle, but for me, uh, very ripe 
red cherry. And there's there's this little tiny note uh, of that of that forest uh, floor, that forest influence that comes from the proximity to the trees, but also that lightness of the fruit on the nose that comes from the elevation and that really stark change between daytime and nighttime temperatures. You have um, just a lot more elegance in the fruit. So it's not like overcooked. You're not smelling raisins or dates or something like that or figs. It's very, very nice light fruit. But why don't we taste it? Yeah, definitely. The feeling that I'm getting from this immediately is that, you know, scent is, I think, the most powerful sense linked to memory. And this is why I really like wine, is that having a taste of this and smelling this, it puts me back in sitting in, in a piazza in Catania. It puts me back sitting in uh, at one of the, the tasting rooms on Etna because this is such a, I mean, I think that all of the, the Sicilian wines, but particularly Norello Mascalese has such a unique smell but for me honestly i'm i'm sitting right now with you in you know one of the, the cantinas that we visited it's just really interesting how that suddenly okay. just goes wow where's the where's the cheese where's the where are all my friends where are my sicilian friends <laughs> yeah so you can, yeah. you can almost smell you can almost smell the terracotta tile almost in, in a way yeah, and for me here. for me that's it that's an interesting an interesting element to pick up um in the wine in the smell, but also as that, uh, as that aroma carries through the palate, you have that echo of red fruit, but what we sense most on the palate with Etna wines is a, a very savory quality, almost a, a saline quality, and a structure that comes from the youth of the volcanic soil that hasn't had an opportunity to really break down and soften and fold in with organic material. You have really vibrant minerals and nutrients feeding these plants. So you can sense that in these wines, they, they feel nervous almost. <laughs> and it, it's, it's perpetual, it's still on my tongue. It's still carrying forward. It's, it's like, I, I compare it a lot to uh, drinking um, just still water Maybe something that's been, um, I don't know, you know, filtered 10,000 times uh, and put into a bottle. And then like a fresh mineral water where you drink the bottled water that's sort of flat. It, it actually just coats your tongue and goes down. But mineral water stays, stays around on your mouth and almost feels dry after you've, you know, you've put it down. And this has, this has a little bit of the element, but that, that, barrel aging, that barrique and tono aging for just a few months um, gives it a, a subtle softness, uh, a subtle sweetness that, uh, that also sort of calms all that mineral uh, and, and nervousness down for me on the palate. And I mean, I, I could throw anything from, you know, salmon to, uh, to beef. Uh, on a plate with this and be happy or cheeses, aged cheeses and uh, fresh ricotta. Yeah. yeah, I'm thinking like cheese would be really fantastic with this. So Gambino is an interesting winery because it's probably the highest up on the mountain. I mean, that I've seen. This one, it says that it's it was grown at 800 meters. Uh, and even if a lot of the, yeah. the Etna wineries are at a higher altitude, this one I think is the highest altitude, isn't it? Or close to. Yeah, it, it's close to it. Everyone likes to say we're the highest winery on that. <laughs> so uh, be wary of, of those claims. <laughs> in any case, it's, uh, uh, it is very high. And in that particular area, it, it's actually a, a contrada or a district neighborhood um, called Petto Dragone, which means the breast of the dragon. So you know it's high because of the name, uh, but it's also... Um, uh, one of the most beautiful places to see that uh, that eastern northeastern coastline. You can see Darmina, Reggio Calabria. Um, you can even see the Pelerotani and the Bedonier uh, mountains in the distance. So it's it's very high up there, um, and uh, 
it's, it's a great place to grow some fruit for sure. Well, and their tasting room, I think, has the most stunning views. I mean, there are some other tasting rooms that I think are more charming, but in terms of just the, the surrounding scenery, you can sit on their deck and you see this incredibly expansive view of the mountain and the sea and Taromina. Yeah. I mean, it's, I don't, I don't know if anything gets more romantic than that personally, so. <laughs> yeah, I, I really, I really do like it. And uh, one of the other nice things uh, about Gambino, and, and we're, we're friends, we we see each other on the street and uh, at parties and stuff. And um, uh, they're super friendly. Uh, the second you walk in the door, you get a, a, a glass of uh, of wine offered to you. Um, it doesn't matter what your language is. Somebody there speaks it. And uh, for me, as a trained winemaker, uh, I've worked as a psalm, as a, a journalist, um, their education program, uh, their follow through in teaching every guest that comes through their, their cellar is, is phenomenal. So, yeah, and one of the things I think that is part of your mission that I think also Gambino is good at is that it's making wine something that's not just for fancy people and demystifying it because I think a lot of people yeah. who might be watching this right now are thinking, well, I don't have a sophisticated enough palate to be able to taste cherries or I don't get it when they say it should be white flowers or whatever. And I've never bought into that whole thing because I think that wine should be a pleasure. And the number one goal of having conversations like you and I are having, or when I'm on tour with people and I take them to wine tastings, my goal is for them to understand why they like something. It doesn't need to be that you like what I like, because that's like, you know, styles of glasses. You're not going to wear the same style of glasses I'm wearing because we're different. Uh, so it's I nice. kind of like the glasses, though. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so, you know, that's the thing is that we can, we can admire each other's taste, but everybody has a different palate so if you taste a wine and you don't taste cherries in this maybe you do maybe you don't uh, maybe it triggers a different memory so you know it's always good for people to Absolutely. look at wine as something that is um, accessible and I think that's part of your mission of your teaching through the Edna Wine School right? Yeah absolutely and for me that that's a lot of the fun about wine you know I <laughs> I, I joke uh, with guests sometimes that, you know, when I first started um, into wine, not even, not even working in wine, but I started like liking wine. Um, I was young, uh, but I, I liked the, the cheapest stuff. It fit my budget. It was perfect for me. And now after going through all the training and now we're working on almost 20 years in the wine business um i'm <laughs> i'm i'm back to almost the same spot i i know what i like i don't care what anybody else really says about it i it, it is my palate and palates are super personal we all have our our, our body memories that we uh, return to. And for me in the beginning, it was like, you know, American cereals and bags of candy from the local corner store every day. You know, it was, it was those sweet things that, uh, that uh, connected me to, to wine. But, you know, the more you dive into it, if, if, if you're interested in doing something like that, the more personal it becomes. And the more specific it comes to those special moments, when you open that interesting wine, it doesn't have to be spectacular, but you remember the first time you, you had your first Etna wine or your first uh, Retsina or something uh, that just you know, blew your mind, um, not only for what it does on your palate, but for the story behind it. And, uh, Really, wine, wine's not meant to be stuffy. It shouldn't be stuffy. And my goal is for those who want to study wine in depth or to find a great bottle for dinner is to give you that opportunity here on Etna. And like I said, it, it, it's really the best place to check out wine because everyone is still learning on the job everyone's still experimenting and so they're still very much in that 
in that zone of discovering for themselves what Aetna is for them. Wow, that's a really beautiful way to put it. So yeah, I um, couldn't yeah. have put it better myself. So I think that Aetna for sure is, a, is an area to explore whether or not you're interested in wine. And this, uh, again, just so people know yeah. what we're drinking, it's the Gambino Tifeo, which you can find them. Uh, their website is vinigambino.it if you want to check them out. And I think it's an absolutely beautiful bottle of wine. As I said, I just happen to have it and I didn't cho choose this specifically for any promotional reason. I just happen to have a bottle of this in my cellar. Uh, but uh, this is actually- I'm glad you had it. I'm really yeah. glad you had it because this is delicious right now. <laughs> yeah, I know. This is actually one of the better wines I've had from Edna, to be honest. You know, some of the wines have sort of grated on my nerves, but this one is is actually- suits me very, very well. So I'm really super pleased with it. So you can check out Gambino Wines there. And for those of you who might be interested in heading to Sicily, um, you can actually hang out with Ben Spencer personally. And what is your website, Ben? How do people get in touch with you? Um, Etnawineschool.com. Etna and I'm also uh, connected on uh, Instagram and Facebook as well. So Etna Wine School, wherever you see that. Uh, send a flare and I'm happy to to chat and make uh, make some special things happen and uh, your book is available is that on Amazon or where where can people pick up your book yeah um, people can get it on Amazon um, the new wines of Mount Etna it's just the volcano on the cover um, it is available through Amazon and paperback and also in EPUB and so I'm just going to spring this on you, uh, Ben, but I have been thinking if travel opens up for the fall, uh, I might try to put together a little maybe six, seven person uh, staycation in your zone. And maybe one Ooh. of those days could be spending a day with you wandering around some wineries on Etna. So uh, stay tuned. I like it. Yeah, if travel re resumes to Italy, I'm definitely heading to Sicily first. So maybe in early September, if we can gather up a group of willing folks who want to try uh, doing that, maybe you and I can coordinate on uh, taking people out to see the mountain and to see some wineries. So I, I would absolutely love that. I would love that too. So it's, it's always fun to spend time with you. So, hey, Ben, why don't we think about another uh, wine that we can discuss another day? And I'll see if I can get my hands on a bottle here uh, because it's just, I love to have an excuse to talk to you. Absolutely. Yeah, it's really nice to catch up. It is. It's so nice to see you too. So I hope everything's going well in Sicily. I miss the island so much. So you'll have to yeah. give the mountain a kiss for me. So <laughs> I, I will go outside. No, I'll, I'll wait. I'll wait. Yeah, uh, I'll go up the mountain and do it. Okay, you can give Mama and a, a blower kiss for me. <laughs> nice, you got it, you got it. Well, thank you so much, Ben, for joining us. And again, I hope that we do get a chance to talk another day. Well, maybe we can just make Wednesday always Wines Day, and we'll talk about another wine at another time. So uh, I really appreciate Hello. you joining us. For all of you out there who've watched today, grazie mille, come sempre. Uh, and tomorrow, we have a different guest on. My guest is going to be Alfredo Vitale, who is my friend uh, who lives in Naples. And we are going to be cooking uh, involtini di melanzane tomorrow. So if you have an eggplant sitting around oh. and some cheese, uh, we're going to teach you how to do that. And then Friday, I'll be joined by my friend Anna Piperato, who's going to give us a tour of Siena. So everybody come, come back tomorrow and the next day, and we'll have some more adventures uh, in Italy, adventures with Sarah, and today, adventures with Ben Spencer. So again, thank you, Gambino Vini, uh, for a wonderful wine. And thank you, my friend Ben. We will see you again soon. Thank you. Talk to you soon. Ciao. Yes. Talk to you soon. Ciao. Buona serata.